I think that's all. So uh, we have a quick change to the timetable just to start with. Um, Paul Adams will speak before John stands, otherwise we're running according to schedule. So thank you. Yes, I'm not John Spence, as you can tell. Uh, so I'm going to give a, a very sort of a high level uh, set of thoughts about FELs and crystallography. This will be a gentle sort of start to the day, and things will get, I guess, harder and more in depth quickly. I think the first thing to say is that I'm sure everybody realizes this in the room, but crystallography is now a very mature technique and very uh, you know, widely used and widely accepted. Uh, a lot of developments over the years in terms of uh, you know, x-rays, being able to actually see diffraction patterns, collect diffraction patterns, and then uh, investigating things like anomalous scattering, eventually leading to a lot of the very interesting and important structures that we see these days. To the point that actually this year, as many of you will know, this is the International Year of uh, Crystallography. I'm not sure people realize what a big deal that is. If you think about the other things that has been an international year of, it's things like, you know, most of it's not science, actually. But things that have been science is for like an international year of chemistry or, you know, astronomy. This is really the only thing that I can see where this is called that specific discipline. That's how important crystallography is or has become uh, over time. And I, again, I think everybody knows this. Doesn't certainly need convincing, but X-ray crystallography uh, is is a very um, high information content science. Uh, we certainly get a lot of information about structure of molecules. We at the right resolutions, we even get information about chemistry. We can distinguish between atoms, and that's led to a lot of you know very important biologically important structures uh, over the years. Uh, more and more people looking at things like membrane proteins, large complexes. And we're also reaching a point at which we can think about trying to extract other information from diffraction experiments, such as dynamics. Now, there's a number of people who've been sort of working on this over the years, but the computational methodology uh, is now at a point where we can try and extract information about how molecules move in crystals, which is another part of what we have to think about. And I will, I will state that one of the reasons that crystallography is where it is now is because of development of technology. If we'd been stuck with some of the things that were, were done you know, a century ago, we wouldn't have got very far. But there has been an amazing development in technology in crystallography over the last, uh, well, over the last 100 years, but certainly in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, it's just been remarkable to see the, the uh, advances in instrumentation, both for making crystals, which is still typically the most difficult thing we have to deal with, uh, to collecting the data, uh, advanced detectors for actually detecting the x-rays, and then techniques such as anomalous phasing for solving the phase problem, and molecular biology methods such as SLENOMET for making that a much easier thing, and um, software algorithms to help process and uh, analyze our data. I've been involved in that field for 15 years. There are people in the audience I see have been involved for many, many, many more years at that. And it's just amazing what's happened in the last 15 years. But there's always room for more developments of, uh, of new techniques uh, to help in crystallography. And of course, one of the areas where we benefited greatly has been uh, how we generate our x-rays. Certainly when I first started doing crystallography, it was with a sealed tube. And that was great. It was actually great for doing small molecule structures. It was quite easy. But uh, for macromolecules, uh, really not enough photons. So uh, rotating anodes were developed. We don't have time to go into why that was, you know, uh, what, what the technology is behind that. And you can sort of think of this being a light bulb compared to the match that the uh, uh, sealed tube was. But in the 70s and beyond, we've, we've begun to have access to accelerator sources such as synchrotrons. And these are really more like the sun, you know, compared to a light bulb. Just the amount and intensity of photons we can get is, is incredible. This, of course, is the ALS here, which is right through there. But this has had a really big impact in our field. And without accelerators, we would not be where we are in crystallography now. 
And so you're going to hear for the next two days are about FELs as a, as a, as a new source of, uh, of light, of x-rays. And I'm not going to talk much about that really, but just to say that uh, the, the difference, the fundamental difference between a storage ring, such as the new one being built in Brookhaven, and an FEL, such as the one across the bay, Stanford, is really uh, how these photons are delivered. If you actually look at uh, the average power that these kinds of machines deliver, it's about the same. You know, over a period of time, you get the same amount of photons. But at an FEL, we get them uh, very quickly, in femtoseconds instead of picoseconds, and we get all of them uh, in one femtosecond or a few femtoseconds instead of spread out over lots and lots of small pulses. So that's the fundamental difference between these two kinds of sources. And you'll see how we've learned how to take uh, advantage of that uh, as a source. And if you think about that, sort of synchrotron is the Gatling gun, firing rapid shocks um, uh, quickly. And then the FEL is something more like this. As you can imagine, it doesn't fire rapid shots, but it delivers a lot, one go. Which, the face value may be a bit daunting. What do we try and do with this? You know, this looks like uh, maybe it's too much to deal with. Now, if we think back to the FEL's uh, inception, LCLS, the case that one of the cases that was made for the LCLS, why, why the department of Danish should build that machine, uh, there were a number of, of specific scientific cases put forward, and one of them was in the biological or biosciences area, and, and it was this, a coherent diffractive, uh, diffraction imaging. And the idea was that we were going to be able to uh, put very intense X-ray pulses through single molecules, collect diffraction patterns, and from that derive the structures of molecules, which sounds fantastic, and actually was very persuasive, I think, for the Department of Energy, one of the reasons it was persuasive is because we wouldn't have to do crystallography anymore. You could just look at single molecules and we wouldn't have to worry about getting crystals. And of course, the challenge with this kind of experiments is there's extremely weak scattering from a single molecule. I think everybody realizes that. Now, 10 years later, this is where we are now, what has really been the success, maybe one of the defining successes of the LCLS, has been nanocrystallography. So there's a bit of an irony there. The, the goal was to try and get rid of crystallography, but the success has really been crystallography again, so you can't keep us down. <laughs> and there are reasons for that, mainly because the weakness of the scattering from a single molecule is one of the fundamental problems, and if we have crystals, we have enhanced scattering. And I think everybody's familiar with this idea now, and you're certainly going to hear more and more about this from other folks. Uh, sort of seminal experiment from Chapman et al. Uh, in 2011, uh, with a way to deliver crystals to the X-ray beam, and then collect diffraction images. And uh, maybe somewhat miraculously to some people, diffraction was there. You could see diffraction, and you could actually do something with these images. So why would we want to do crystallography at an, an FEL source? Well, I mean, one thing is because it's there and we're scientists and we're going to use what's out there, but there really are some good reasons. One is that we think about the traditional experiment that we do at a, with a crystal at a synchrotron. We know that X-rays generate photoelectrons that generate radicals, free radicals floating through our crystal. And these free radicals break bonds. We get secondary damage. And we get, people have done experiments, this is a crystallographic experiment here, where people have shown that at the start, uh, or, or a, a, a non-exposed crystal to X-rays, or very limited exposure, we can see these chemical features, blast them with X-rays for a while and collect more data. We see specific things have disappeared, uh, like the uh, uh, carbon dioxide being released here, for example, or the sulfur being laid on and being broken. And of course, in conventional crystallography, that led to use of uh, cryocooling of crystals to try and slow down free radical movement so that we would trap the free radicals, they wouldn't go and kill our protein. The great thing about FELs, and this was based on a lot of theoretical calculations and ultimately experiments, is that we can uh, deliver the photons in such a way that we get diffraction before we get any of these damage effects. Although, 
I will say, I've said here no radiation damage. That's not really been 100% demonstrated, I would claim. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to support this, but there are still experiments ongoing at the LCLS to try and actually really definitively prove that there's no damage. But the signs are good. So that means that we can try and get rid of this damage problem, which is one of really the important problems we faced in, in conventional crystallography. Uh, we can do things at room temperature. So we can try and do crystallography at physiologically relevant temperatures instead of cryocool temperatures. And then finally, this very high beam brightness makes it possible to look at very, very small crystals. And these are crystals here on the sort of submicron scale, very thin membrane protein crystals that can actually be used in, a, in an FEL experiment. So these are all things that traditionally have been difficult to do with synchrotrons. I would say that I think some of the advances that we're going to see in synchrotron sources, such as diffraction limited rings, may make some of these things possible as synchrotrons, uh, although I think outrunning the radiation damage is not really a feasible thing to do. Uh, the, the nature of the FEL, FEL experiment has, has made people think about how to deliver our sample. This has been, I think, one of the very important contributions from the FEL field already in crystallography. And you'll hear more from others about sample delivery, I'm sure, but the idea being that uh, we can't, we're going to have a machine that runs at 100 hertz. We can't be having hand-mounted samples that we put in front of the beam so easily. That's really not going to work. So there's a lot of investment uh, by a lot of people at Arizona State, actually, in how to build hardware to deliver streams of crystals in liquid jets. Uh, that's what's shown here. <coughs> General setup for a lot of experiments now is to have a, a reservoir of crystals, small crystals that are delivered through one of these jets and then uh, are hit by the beam. And you can do nice things like uh, pump probe experiments uh, with lasers to actually activate samples before they uh, hit the beam. Now, there are some challenges with devices like this. Uh, they generate a lot of, uh, they need a lot of sample to run, a lot of crystals milligrams to you know, maybe in the worst case grams of sample. Not so appealing for a lot of biologists um, who don't have that much sample to work with. So more recently there's been uh, developments in the area of uh, LCP, uh, uh, lipidic cubic phase uh, injectors designed for membrane proteins, but it turns out could maybe be used equally well for soluble protein crystals just as a, as a way, as a medium to deliver the sample. Um, this has a lot of nice properties, but in particular very low flow rates, so a lot less in terms of sample use. So I think one of the exciting things we're seeing is that some of this technology that's been developed for the FEL experiments is now feeding back into synchrotrons. There's a paper recently about doing a similar kind of experiment to the FEL experiment, so a serial crystallography experiment really, at, uh, uh, this was a Petra, um, but this is a news thing from ESRF where they're trying to do similar experiments. So people are trying to make use of these injectors of various forms at synchrotron rings. I think this is important because one of the worst things we do to our samples as crystallographers is touch them. Right? These are very fragile crystals. We start messing around with them. It's not very good for them. So uh, how we can exploit these new technologies to improve our conventional crystallography is very uh, important. Now, of course, we can do diffraction experiments, we can collect data, what do we do with that data? And this is the theme of the workshop, so I'm not going to say much about this. You're going to learn an awful lot from, from several different people. But one thing I wanted to point out was that there is a bit of a convergence, again, in terms of of conventional crystallography and FEL uh, crystallography. Uh, if you look at the detectors that are sort of either being used or on the horizon, uh, there are a lot of uh, pixel array detectors. All of these are from Dectris, a Swiss company. Those current detectors can generate you know, half a terabyte an hour. The next generation is generating maybe two terabytes an hour because they frame uh, at a higher rate. Uh, the next biggest set of detectors is 10 terabytes an hour. This is very similar to the kind of data rates that we actually have at the FELs uh, because they're running, you can see, potentially at similar sort of framing rates. So this is the CS pad uh, at LCLS and ADSC is developing a, another pixel array device. So 
the demands on data processing from synchrotrons and FELs are in a sense converging. And this is maybe a good thing because there's an opportunity to develop software that, that really deals with both sides of this. Uh, so the, just to mention one project that I'm aware of, the DIALS project, this kind of collaboration between folks in, in the UK uh, and in, here in Berkeley, Nick Sams is here, are really trying to build uh, the, the next generation of data processing software that, that, that thinks about the commonality between all of these things. Because we have things like the CS pad detector uh, across the bay, but there are also uh, fairly amazing detectors being built. This is the one for sulfur phasing being built at uh, Diamond that you know have a level of complexity which is very similar uh, and a potential framing rate that's very similar as well. So, it, you know, I think the good thing is that we're going to have software infrastructure that will make it possible to exploit all of these different sources uh, and for people to plug in their software and make use of it. So there are still challenges for crystallography at FELs. Uh, the data processing is non-trivial, as you'll hear. And it's probably why you're here to some degree to learn, how, learn why it's non-trivial and how to, how to solve those problems. But uh, you know we, we're dealing with experiments where we have partial reflections. It's not the typical experiment that we do at a, at a, at a synchrotron. And currently, the source of x-rays tends to be um, quite um, challenging in terms of the structure of the, of the x-ray pulse. One of the big challenges is obtaining novel structures. I mean, truly novel, beyond like a replacement. Uh, multiple groups now have demonstrated anomalous scattering, but I would claim that data processing is still a challenge when we're dealing with very weak signal uh, in the anomalous diffraction case. So there's some examples where you know anomalous diffraction can be seen, but extracting that is still difficult. And I would also say that we need better detectors. It's always possible to get better sample delivery, and ultimately beamline availability is an issue at the FEL sources. We can't solve that with technology necessarily, but it's something that needs to be thought about. And we face general challenges in crystallography. This isn't specific to FELs, but uh, more and more in crystallography, we end up looking at, at low resolution, large complexes, things that are difficult to interpret. Uh, you know, we, we potentially end up, end up with electron density maps that look like this. And, you know, what is that? Well, we know what it is actually in this particular case. It's a bunch of helices, but if you didn't know that, it would just be a bunch of sausages, right? So it's not really clear what it is. So how do we extract information from uh, uh, diffraction experiments that give us results like this? And then how do we optimize those? And there are some methods that have been developed. I, I won't spend the time to talk about that, but, but uh, these are really common problems to both FELs and, and uh, synchrotron uh, experiments. So I think there's a lot of new possibilities with FELs. This workshop uh, maybe will be focused more in the uh, diffraction areas such as nanocrystallography, but things like uh, scattering experiments can benefit greatly potentially. People like Peter Svart and others are developing methods in that area. And we shouldn't forget the original idea behind the FELs, uh, the biology, which was single particles. I think that's the slow progress there, but um, maybe, maybe that works out eventually. So, just to finish up, I would say that there's actually a common vision. This is sort of my prediction in a sense that you know both synchrotrons and FELs will be used for crystallography in the future. And many of the experimental methods will be shared. We see the sample delivery has an impact in both areas. Data processing, trying to get the most out of the experiments that we do. And then uh, fortunately, in a sense, the structure solution analysis methods are kind of common between the two uh, sources. So we don't have to reinvent the way we solve structures necessarily. So I think there will be specializations in terms of what experiments we do at what sources, but there will be a common goal, which is really getting the best structures to understand biology. That's what we want to do. Right? So I would, I would say that learning how to analyze FEL data like we're doing here is something that will help you really analyze all kinds of data in the future. So I think that's a very good thing to be doing. 
Okay, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but that was just to give you a very high-level picture of crystallography and MPS.